Hi, it's Ryan. We're going to continue our notes on stellar evolution. We're going to begin our notes on medium mass stars. So we concluded our notes on low mass stars in the last video. And that means we're going to have to start back at step one. But step one through step six are almost entirely the same, except for one small adjustment. So step one through step six, we're going to say this is the same as low mass stars with the exception of the hydrogen fusion that is taking place in the core. So in medium mass stars, <clears throat> the hydrogen fusion process is called the NCO cycle. And what this is, this is called the NCO cycle because nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen um, help, uh, help catalyze the hydrogen fusion so that it it really goes much faster. So we're not dealing with the proton-proton chain anymore. We're dealing with something that um, creates helium from hydrogen at a much faster rate. So we're going to note that the NCO cycle is hydrogen fusion catalyzed by nitrogen, carbon, and oxygen. When we say catalyzed, we just basically mean accelerated. The NCO cycle is still hydrogen fusion, and so the end product is basically still four hydrogen turning us into helium and some energy. So it still looks similar, it's just happening much faster. And we actually shouldn't capitalize these element names. So keep in mind uh, all the chemists mean when they say a catalyst is that it is accelerating um, a, a reaction. And as I said, the result is still really giving us helium. Um, but we could note that this form of hydrogen fusion, we're going to say burns hydrogen that's sort of a slang word way we talk about uh, this chemical reaction turning hydrogen to helium. This uh, form of hydrogen fusion burns hydrogen um, at hundreds or even thousands of times the rate as the proton-proton chain. Um, so, as I said, uh, steps one through six are virtually identical, um, except where we discuss the proton-proton chain, it's now a much more complicated and accelerated chemical reaction. So we're, our star is going to burn hotter than our low-mass stars. It's going to be bluer in color, so it might be white uh, and it's going to live much shorter of a lifetime because it's burning its fuel so much faster. So we're going to go ahead and go to step seven. So keep in mind, step six, uh, after the NCO cycle begins, our star just um, lives as a star for 
uh, 90% of its life. Eventually, though, the fuel, the hydrogen fuel, begins to exhaust. So we'll say, uh, as the hydrogen fuel in the core, And all we're going to see is uh, the core begin to collapse again, and our star will turn into a red giant. <clears throat> we're going to say the core is made of mostly degenerate helium, just like before. Remember, degenerate helium is the helium in the core that is not undergoing any fusion processes. There's not enough uh, thermal energy or pressure to cause the alpha particles to start combining together with the triple alpha process. Um, we're going to note that... Um, Hydrostatic equilibrium is lost with the loss of radiative pressure the core begins to collapse and the outer shell outer layers, we'll say, the outer layers cool and expand, leaving the star a red giant. So the collapse will continue, but eventually the temperatures and pressures will reach critical. The helium will ignite in an event called, of course. So we'll write that. It's not called, of course, but eventually the temperatures and pressures in the core reach critical. And the helium ignites in an event called, of course, step eight, the helium flash. So very much like uh, the low mass star, the helium flash will occur and the, uh, the flash will eject approximately 25% of the star's outer layers and helium fusion will continue until a similar event happens. So we'll say um, this flash ejects the outer layers of the star. And we think up to 25%. And helium fusion, and remember it happens via the triple alpha process begins. Keep in mind, this is when helium is converted into carbon and some energy. This happens very fast. The helium fusion is um, extremely accelerated relative to the hydrogen fusion. And so um, in, the, in terms of the star's life, this happens very, very fast. And we'll say eventually, but this is a shorter eventually, the helium fuel runs low. The core, which is now mostly, uh, we'll say the core of degenerate carbon, begins to contract temperatures and pressures in the core reach critical 
and the carbon is ignited in a, we're going to say step nine. You guessed it, a carbon flash. And so this is going to get a little repetitive, so I'll probably shorten how I describe it. But basically, the carbon flash tells us that carbon fusion will begin in the core of our star. Uh, carbon fusion converts carbon into oxygen. Um, and actually, we could note that actually it, it looks something like carbon plus helium to give us the oxygen plus energy. So we could note then that carbon fusion, carbon fusion produces oxygen until the core runs low on carbon fuel We can say carbon burning ceases. The core, uh, we could just say leaving degenerate oxygen. Leaving degenerate oxygen, I like that. The core begins to collapse again. And it will continue to collapse until, of course, the temperatures and pressures are high enough to begin a new type of fusion. So we're on step 10. We get the O flash, signifying, of course, that oxygen fusion is occurring. Oxygen fusion combines oxygen with uh, helium to produce neon. produce neon and, of course, some energy. Um, oh, I'm sorry. It's typically, I'm sorry I wrote that with two. It should be one. There's another uh, somewhat common reaction that I was thinking of that produces magnesium and energy. So this one's less common. And there's probably others as well, but just for funsies. So as I said, it's going to kind of feel very redundant, so we can note that eventually the uh, oxygen fuel is exhausted. The core begins to collapse on the degenerate neon. until temperatures and pressures reach critical. And what happens, of course, a neon flash. It's probably the most pretty of the flashes, in my opinion. When we talk about neon burning, neon, uh, I'm sorry, Neon burning combines neon and helium to produce. You could look up at the, at the um, periodic table and see that it's silicon. Neon burning combines neon 
plus two helium to give us silicon plus energy. Until, of course, it runs out of neon fuel. So I'm going to note a little differently now. At this point, the core is mostly degenerate carbon, or I'm sorry, degenerate um, silicon. And the collapse occurs. I want to um, do a brief note though. So we're gonna say, in order to fully appreciate, in order to fully appreciate the next stage in, in fusion, we need to look at the core of our star. And I should say in the fusion process, that makes more sense. In the fusion process, we need to look at the core of our star. And so we're gonna um, draw the stellar core. Sounds like a cool science fiction movie. I'm actually gonna do that on a separate um, page. So we're drawing the stellar core here. And I'm basically going to draw six concentric circles. And so we're kind of looking at a, a slice of the center of the core of the star that we're um, discussing, the medium mass stellar object. So there we go, and I'm going to note that in the center we have our degenerate silicon, degenerate silicon, and so I think that should probably be a little bit bigger. I feel like uh, these could all be a little smaller, these shells, and that could be a little bigger, so, well, this will work anyway. So this center of our core is a de the core made of degenerate silicon and then each of these circles represent what we call a burn shell so it's sort of the leftover elements from the previous fusion processes so this outer shell is our hydrogen burn shell and so um, as i had mentioned maybe in our first set of stellar evolution notes the stars uh, don't actually burn up every piece of their mass when they're undergoing fusion. Uh, so there will be some leftover hydrogen that, uh, that is still there after the hydrogen fusion ceases. And so in the, uh, as more and more heavier elements gather in the core, the gravitational forces help separate these into shells where the lightest elements sit on the outer shell and the heavier elements sit on the shells inside of it. So this is, of course, our next element, which was helium. This represented, of course, then carbon. Uh, 
oxygen, and then neon. I'm going to do neon in red because it looks the most like its atomic spectrum. And it looks the most really like it looks IRL. So uh, our core, even though it's sort of trying to begin its silicon fusion now, uh, it still has all the other elements from the previous fusion processes, just not enough to have maintained the burn cycles that they were going through. So that's a cute little depiction of the core of our star. And we're still sort of in step 10. And so we can say as the collapse as collapse occurs, temperatures and pressures reach critical and the silicon is ignited. So as the collapse occurs, temperatures and pressures reach critical and silicon fusion begins. This fusion process combines silicon with silicon. So we take silicon plus silicon, and if you look at a periodic table, this will produce um, iron. And some energy. It turns out iron is sort of the stopping point for fusion processes. Um, this is where no more fusion will take place. Uh, so I'm going to actually note that this is a lot of energy. Silicon fusion begins, so we're going to continue from there. The fusion process is so catastrophic. It's so energetic. that the explosion, the silicon flash, if you will, completely destroys the star. completely destroys the star in a phenomenon called and that will give us our last step this was step so we're on step 12 the phenomenon is called a supernova A supernova. It results in the complete and utter destruction of our star. This, this event is so energetic that every element is created during the explosion. Every element is produced through random fusions during this explosion. I want to do a little blurb, supernova blurb. So it turns out there's a well-known supernova. It's called the, I'm going to call it what they do, AD 1054 supernova. It was uh, recorded by um, China. Uh, so the star... So they thought, what they thought they saw was a star appear in the sky. 
which was actually the supernova. So there was no star there one day, and then all of a sudden, a very, very bright star appeared. It was visible during the day for 23 days. And up to 63 days when the sun was on the horizon. And it was visible for 653 nights. So for over two years, this star appeared and then existed in the night sky. And for uh, almost two, uh, a little over two months, it existed in the daytime sky as well. I can't imagine what they must have thought. Although they did write about it, so we can't imagine. Uh, the star that exploded, so the dead star, oops, the star that exploded was in Taurus, uh, I should say is 6,300 light years away <clears throat> from Earth. So that really means that it we, the explosion we saw happened 6,300 years beforehand, but that's neither here nor there. Um, we can note that it is now a high-density stellar remnant at the center of the Crab Nebula in Taurus. And that's the end of our blurb. But it's interesting. Uh, the other interesting fact I can give you about a supernova, the supernova produces more energy. So keep in mind, our sun is converting 4.6 billion kilograms of matter to pure energy every second. That's like 4.6 million Ford focuses every second being converted to pure energy. This supernova produces more energy in one second. In one second than our galaxy emits in an entire century. That's the Milky Way galaxy, if you were unfamiliar with where you live. Our galaxy has at least 200 billion stars, similar to the size or larger than our sun. And those are each producing as much or more energy than our sun. And... Uh, this single explosive event creates more energy than our whole galaxy does in, a, in an entire century, and it does it in less than a second. And that's why all of the elements are produced. Oh, another cool thing, by the way, the approximate mass loss, so the approximate mass to energy conversion uh, during this event is approximately the mass of our sun. So we'll say the approximate mass loss, or we could say mass conversion, is equivalent to the mass of our sun. So in less than one second, this event takes our sun and turns it into pure energy. Infathomable, but we'll do our best. Step 13. 
So the iron that remains after the total destruction of the star has nothing to stop its collapse. There's no more fusion that can happen. The iron that remains cannot fuse and continues to collapse until the protons are completely destroyed and the remaining body consists of pure neutrons. If you're having trouble trying to perceive what a pure neutron is, that's fine. We don't really get this. Neutrons aren't stable on their own. They should have no charge. But these neutrons seem to stick together in an extremely dense entity that we call a neutron star. A neutron star a high-density stellar remnant that is the end point for all medium mass stars. We could note that some neutron stars become pulsars. Some neutron stars are called pulsars and the reason for that is uh, that some neutron stars often emit a um, radio frequency and they're spinning excessively fast and if that radio frequency happens to be pointed at earth sometimes then we can receive excuse me we can receive a radio frequency that seems to be repeating at very fast, um, a very fast frequencies. So, or very high frequencies. Uh, it turns out, um, someone actually had discovered this, but did not know that neutron stars would do this. So they thought they just discovered a very fast radio frequency coming from somewhere in space, and with maybe a little bit too much hope called the frequency an LGM, and that LGM st stood for Little Green Men. So our scientists believe that she discovered uh, a signal produced by other living organisms uh, many light years away. Later we found out that it was just a silly neutron star, but it's neat that she discovered a pulsar and coined it as Little Green Men because we're always hopeful that we can find other life out there. Uh, anyway, <clears throat> it's interesting that to know that a neutron star is typically the mass of three, uh, three to five of our suns. So typically, neutron stars have mass, uh, we can say masses of three to five solar masses. But diameters of approximately six miles. <laughs> that means if you set a neutron star in the middle of Detroit, it, uh, well, I guess you could say this, the diameter of a neutron star is approximately the distance of downtown Dearborn to downtown Detroit. It would fit in between Dearborn and Detroit if you plopped a neutron star on 94. <clears throat> neutron stars will live a long long time these live for a long long time 
So that's a crash course in medium mass stars and some interesting stuff along the way. I hope you enjoyed. Have a wonderful